Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to take a look at pressure and kind of define that and give us some ways to take a, start looking at pressure. Okay, so uh, start off, um, how do we create pressure? Okay, so pressure is created when different particles push on the surface of a container. Okay, so if you think about it, uh, if you shake up a pop can or those kind of things, you're generating extra gases, so they're making more collisions on the outside of the container, so it increases pressure. If you want to fill a tire full of air, you pump more air particles in, so there's more collisions against the sides of the container that can generate more pressure. Okay, uh, pressure also can come from the gas particles in our environment actually pushing down on us and colliding with us. So that is atmospheric pressure, those kind of things. So really, pressure comes from collisions from particles to the surface of their containers. Okay, the way we measure is uh, pressure is force divided by area. So it's the force pushed over a certain amount of area. Okay, so if you take a look at like how do you create pressure, uh, let's say uh, using your body, okay, um, obviously our legs and our arms and our backs are really strong muscles, so they can create a lot of force, um, but the surface area that we push over on those kind of things can tend to be very large, so actually the part of your body, if you think about it, that can generate the most pressure is your teeth and your jaw. Even though your jaw isn't the strongest muscle in your body, um, what happens is, is because where the teeth contact is such a small area, you're dividing by a small area so you can generate a lot of pressure, okay? which would make sense because you can use teeth to rip open you know, foods and that kind of stuff and, and eat where we're using your hands. You couldn't break it apart nearly as well. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what pressure means. It's not just about how powerful something is, but also the amount of area which it kind of works under. Okay. Now, when we work with pressure, there's actually three different labels that we use to measure pressure. I wish we only had one, but we got three. Sorry, it's just the way it is. Um, atmospheres is one. Millimeters of mercury is another one, labeled MMHG, also known as TORS, if you look it up. Uh, they're being the same thing. And then Pascals. Now, of the three, Pascals is the SI system measurement. It is the official one. Um, but you'll see atmosphere is used a lot because we base it compared to the atmospheric pressure. So typical atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. Um, and millimeters of mercury is more of uh, a legacy one where when we first measured pressure, the way scientists did that is they would take mercury and they put it in a dish and then they would put a tube inside the mercury that was a vacuum. So it would be completely void of any air. And then the amount of air pressure pushing down on that mercury would then cause the mercury to rise up that tube to a vacuum. Now at some point, the gravitational pull on the weight of the mercury would stop that from happening and you'd have a balancing act between the atmospheric pressure pushing down and gravity pulling this column back down. And that balancing act was then how many millimeters of mercury we rose. So if you think about it, as pressure went up, as the air pressure pushed down more, we can get the column to go higher. So they actually originally measured pressure by using columns of mercury inside glass tubes. Okay, um, we don't use it anymore because we don't want to have mercury exposed to the open air. But that was kind of where the original measurement kind of came from: is this idea of millimeters, or in that case, it was probably more like inches of mercury at that point. Now, if you take a look at this idea of atmospheric pressure, or what's pushing down on us, uh, basically, as the gases collide with the surface of our planet and the weight of those gases, it actually generates a force pushing on us, and that we call that atmospheric pressure. Okay. Um, atmospheric pressure, if you take a look at it, if you imagine, if we're standing here uh, somewhere in the Midwest, maybe a little bit into Canada here, if you're standing in that column, there's a gravitational pull on the air that's all the way up here, pulling down, pulling down, pulling, pulling down. So the amount of pressure that we feel in this little bit of area, or this surface here, um, comes from the weight of the air pushing on us. So there's always atmospheric pressure pushing on us. Now our bodies are just designed to work in those scenarios. So we were born and we had skeletons to handle that kind of pressure. We don't even think about that until we go hike up a mountain or get in an airplane and change our altitude very quickly or do one of those things where our ears start to pop or our ears start to hurt because we're changing pressure quickly. Okay. Um, same thing happens like if you're you know downhill skiing out in Colorado, you actually have to, your ears may actually start to hurt as you go down in pressure or up in pressure on those chairlifts. Okay, um, it's no different than a fish in water where they can swim through water and they don't feel the pressure. That's because their skeletons and their bodies are designed to be in that kind of pressure of water pushing on them. Whereas us, if we dive down much more than five, ten feet, the pressure on our ears gets almost to a point where it's pain, very painful. It can actually cause problems um, in terms of um, 
the pressure from water on us. So um, really there is pressure on us, there is air particles around us at all times, but we're just designed to handle that uh, in our world, okay? So that's kind of a real quick introduction to pressure. Um, the take home here is that pressure comes from, you know, gas particles primarily push, pushing on the sides of a container. Now pressure can also come from solid things creating a force over a surface area, but we're really gonna be kind of focusing more on the gas particle side of it as we go through these next couple of units. Now the second thing we want to talk about in this video is kinetic energy and temperature, okay? Uh, so kinetic energy and temperature, if we take a look at that, they are related to each other, okay? So first of all, let's kind of define temperature. So temperature actually measures the average kinetic energy of a system, okay? So if we take a look at the kinetic energy across a sample or maybe in a beaker or in a container and we want to get a measure of the average energy of all the particles inside there, that's our temperature, okay? Uh, temperature can be related back to energy that way. Now, when we talk about kinetic energy in a system, keep in mind there's lots of different types of energy. So there's potential energy, which is stored energy. There's chemical energy, which is stored energy in a bond. You know, there's thermal energy. There's all kinds of different types. There's nuclear energy. But whenever you have energy that is doing something or energy of motion that is movement, movement we call that kinetic energy. Okay? So temperature really relates back to measuring the movement of particles. Okay? So as things move faster, we get more temperature because we have more kinetic energy. If things move slower, we have less temperature because we have less kinetic energy in them. Okay? So kind of the take home from that is the higher the temperature, the faster the particles are moving. All right, so we take a look at these two little boxes over here. Um, if you take a look, we have cooler conditions here and we have warmer conditions here. So if they're cooler, you're going to have um, lower kinetic energy, which means there's less temperature, and they're going to be moving slower. So these things will be moving slower, okay? Notice how the tails are made a little shorter than these. Over here, we have high kinetic energy, so they are warmer, and they're going to be moving faster, okay? So if you think about it, let's relate this back to IMF now, okay? So if you have intermolecular forces trying to hold particles together and you have this idea of the particles being able to move faster at higher temperatures, okay, how does temperature affect IMF to hold things in place? Okay, so take a minute, think about it. So if we take a look at this, you know, intermolecular forces are constant. They are set up, they have a certain amount of pull, they're, they're set, that's the way they are, depending on the hydrogen bonds they have, or the dipole-dipole, and the mass of the substance. So if you warm up or cool down that substance, what you're doing is you're giving it more energy or less energy, okay? So if the intermolecular force is pretty much stagnant or pretty much has to be the same, if you give something more energy, it can break free of that easier. If you have less energy, it's harder for it to break free of that. So as we warm up substances, what happens is, is their actually ability to break the intermolecular forces increases because they just have more energy to do that. If we, as we cool them down, their ability to break free of intermolecular forces diminishes. Okay? And that actually kind of makes sense if we look at our solid liquids and gases. Okay? Gases are always our highest temperature. They have so much energy that they are completely broken free of intermolecular forces. Solids are our lowest temperature. Lowest temperature means they have the least amount of energy. So in those cases, they don't have enough energy to break free of those intermolecular forces, so they're locked into that solid structure, okay, between those two things. Now, when you take a look at this, notice how the definition here says average kinetic energy. And that's kind of an important part of this, because as you deal with average kinetic energy, it doesn't mean total energy, okay? So we're just taking an average of the sample, which means some particles in there might be, have more energy, some might have less, but they're all at the same temperature. At any given temperature, the molecules of a gas are in continual motion. At any instant, some molecules have more kinetic energy of motion than others. With increasing temperature, the average kinetic energy increases in proportion to the absolute temperature. This graph shows the distribution of molecular speeds for a particular gas at two different temperatures. Notice that the most probable molecular speed, given by the peak of the curve, increases as the temperature increases. Okay, so we take a look at this. This peak is the average, okay? So if we measure the average speed, that would give us the temperature, okay? So as you get warmer, that peak shifts to the right because our speed increases. Um, 
so we have more energy. So more energy means you shift to the right, you're moving faster, so your peak would speed up. So this peak is the average of this, this graph right here. Okay? You'll also notice how it dips down. Okay? The reason why it dips down is because every particle has the right to be going down to the, to the lowest possible speed of actually moving zero or not moving at all. Okay? So as you get more and more particles that are moving faster to the right, the peaks can't stay as high because you always have to have your left-hand side of your graph grounded at zero or absolute zero temperature. Okay, because some particles are moving very, very, very slowly, and they have they can do that. There's always some that are doing that, whereas some particles are moving very, very fast. So the higher you are, the higher the temperature, um, you're going to shift this graph to the right. Okay, um, as you do this, let's continue on. Here we see a mixture of two gases with different molecular masses helium and neon. The more massive neon atoms move more slowly, but they possess the same average kinetic energy as the helium atoms. At a given temperature, the distribution of molecular speeds for helium is much more spread toward high speeds than for neon. As the temperature increases, the average speeds of both helium and neon atoms increase. At any given temperature, their average kinetic energies are the same. Okay, so if we take a look, now this is a graph of two different substances, okay? So you're kind of responsible for two things. Same substance, different temperatures, what would that look like graphically? And same temperature, two different substances. So in this graph, we have neon versus helium. Neon is a much heavier molecule, or sorry, heavier atom. Helium is a lighter atom, okay? So in this case, they're both at the same temperature. They both have the same average, okay? But because helium is so much lighter, okay, because it's so much lighter, its particles are going to be moving faster at the same temperature. Neon's particles are going to be moving slower at the same temperature, okay? So if we take a look, not only is helium's average further to the right, but it's also much flatter because we have more particles spread out more. So the lighter you are, the more your, par your particles actually spread out. Um, at the same temperature, you'll be moving faster. And for, ne for neon, at the same temperature, its particles are going to be moving slower. Okay? If we actually go back to the beginning of this, gr of this video, uh, someplace here, they flashed the energy, the kinetic energy equation. So if you notice, you're not responsible for the equation, but kinetic energy is equal to both the velocity and the mass. So there's a relationship between mass and velocity. So things that are heavier, they move slower to generate the same amount of energy than things that are fast, lighter. Lighter things need to move faster to generate the same amount of energy, okay? Which then makes sense that we would see the helium should be moving faster um, to generate the same kinetic energy or speed as the neon is at the same temperature. All right, guys. Uh, we're going to talk about this idea a little bit more, um, a little bit more detail here. What I want to show you is this applet here that basically talks about the distribution of speeds. So if I actually start this moving, we see the particles, they're moving at different speeds, okay? And this is kind of like the gas particles in a substance, okay? Um, note how some of them, like this guy, is moving really slow until something hits him. I've still got him right here. Oh, no, he's flying this way. Now he's going. Now I lost him, okay? So you notice that in a sample, all the particles are moving at different speeds. Okay? So all we can do is track the average. Okay? We can't um, pick out the speed of each individual particle. Just, they're just too small. So what we do is we say, what's the average speed of all these particles? So over time, you notice how our graph over here, they're actually graphing the speeds of these different particles. Notice how it's building a nice distribution curve of speeds. Okay? That shows us how many different particles are moving at these different speeds. So if you wanted to find the average speed here, we would find the peak of this curve and we would get that. Okay? Once again, here's one more graph of it. We'll hit it one more time. So this, again, is the same substance. And notice that 100 versus 300 versus 600 versus 1,000 Kelvins, we see the temperature increase. So your averages are at these peaks. And that the hotter you get, the flatter the curve is, and further to the right or the faster that those particles are moving. Okay? You can actually um, go to this website if you guys want to and play with that a little bit more there also for you guys. Okay? All right. We're going to end the video there. Uh, thank you for your time.